from the book of Acts. It's from chapter 20, and this is the second sermon in the two-part series um, called Strange Stories, because uh, these two stories that we've studied last week and this week are extremely odd, to be frank, uh, but they demonstrate that Scripture, and even its strange stories, is filled with powerful, life-transforming truths that God can speak to us through. So uh, today, our story takes us into the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, beginning in verse 6. We read, But we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we joined them in Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them, since he intended to leave the next day. He continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over him, took him into his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to convene with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. May God add his blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer before we reflect. Oh God, we give you thanks again for this chance to gather here today uh, to set aside the busyness of of the rest of our week and to gather just to, to worship you and spend time with you. We pray that you would encourage us and challenge us and and fill us with the strength that we need to fulfill your will this upcoming week. Minister to us where we're in need and, and fill us with the joy of your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we live in an age where convenience is greatly prized. You know, and it's because of the amazing technological advancements our civilization that's made that that has created this really what is a new cultural value. You know, for instance, most human beings throughout the history of the world had relatively limited mobility. They walked or they used animals to travel if they had them. And that was a slow process. But today, we have self-propelled vehicles that, either on roads or rails in the sky and even under the water, they can quickly bring us anywhere we want to go, anywhere in the world, in fact, uh, without much physical labor on our part. Pretty amazing. And pretty convenient as well. Um, Most people throughout the history of the world, likewise, they either had to grow, pick, scavenge, or hunt their own food. But today, we can grow vegetables in a, a garden if we like, but, you know, if you've got a brown thumb like yours truly and everything you grow tries you know you try to grow it ends up dying or the rabbits eat it you can also just visit uh, your local grocery store and pick up food there in the same way entertainment throughout history most of the time it consisted of you know people listening to somebody sing a song or grandpa tell a story but today we have access to Dozens of options at our fingertips, you know, on our televisions or through the internet, or even on devices that we carry in our pockets. In fact, we can even use those same mobile devices to shop. 
And we don't even need to use our fingers anymore. We can talk to invisible digital assistants like Siri or Alexa and ask them to shop for us. I mean, think about it. In years past, if we told somebody that we just asked an invisible, disembodied being in a rectangular box we were holding to do our grocery shopping for us, <laughs> they think we were nuts. They think we were crazy. But today, this is normal. And all this instant access available to us, it's made convenience a value that we cherish. You know, it's something that, that you know, we, we expect almost in many situations. And that's fine. You know, when it comes to ordering dish soap on Amazon.com, but it doesn't work as well when we try to apply it to other areas of life, like forging genuinely strong, lasting relationships with people. You know, that's not quick or effortless at all. You know, yeah, we've, we've got apps, you know, where we can meet people and all this with common, you know, uh, viewpoints or, you know, likes and the like. But, but when we meet them, we actually have to get to know them. And that requires the same amount of hard work, patience, time, and dedication that it always has. Now, that might seem inconvenient to some in a world like ours. But that's reality if we hope to share those kind of relationships with people in our lives. And that's also true of forging a genuine, meaningful relationship with God. You know, many are tempted today to approach their faith in the same spirit as they surf the Internet. You know, I'll, talk, I'll toss up a quick praise or bell tower, a quick prayer, and, and God will bless me right now. Or I'll pick up my Bible and I'll read for a minute and I'll immediately be ushered into the, the deep, you know, depths of, of the divine. And if that doesn't happen, well, this whole spirituality thing, this, this whole God thing, yeah, it's a waste of time. There are too many in our culture who expect a convenient faith, a convenient God, who can be quickly accessed in their ways, according to their timetable, with little effort on their part. And this is tragically why so many studies today consistently indicate that so many people in our culture feel so spiritually impoverished. It's because the creator of this world and everything in it, the Ancient of Days, as God is called in the book of Daniel, isn't just a you know, really big Siri or Alexa in the sky, you know, that we don't need an Amazon Echo or an iPhone to access. We can just sort of speak in God. It's not that way, um, but, but, but God is, instead operates according to God's ways in God's time. So just as it is with other people in our lives, if we hope to share a genuine relationship with our Creator, if we hope to have a vibrant spirituality, to really feel spiritually fulfilled, well, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes sacrifice. It takes patience. It takes humility on our part. And though that might feel inconvenient, it's our willingness to do it that makes it possible for us to live in God's glorious kingdom here on earth and eternally. You know, as Jesus said in our reading from St. Matthew's Gospel today that Carolyn read for us, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. And I mention this because I believe it's one of the principles that our passage today from the book of Acts highlights. They didn't have iPhones and things like that or, or Android phones back when this passage was written, but yet this ancient story speaks powerfully to our culture today. 
As I mentioned before, it's the second in this two-part series that we're studying called Strange Stories because, like the passage about the talking donkey last week that we looked at, you know, the ancient Mr. Ed, um, this story is also filled with powerful truths. It's a part of a larger story in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts that's describing the last missionary journey that the Apostle Paul took through the Roman Empire before he was imprisoned and eventually killed. And our story takes us into the Roman city of Troas, which in Paul's day was a busy, bustling port city. It was located on the Aegean Sea near the northern tip of Turkey's western coast. And to help you visualize that, I put a map in your bulletins today, as I often do, and you can see Troas there, right up there near the top of those other cities, right there on the sea. It was located around uh, where some speculate that the ancient uh, city of Troy uh, was located, that mysterious ancient city. It was in that same region. But when Paul visits Troas in our passage, there's already a church there. There's already an established Christian church. So his goal is to strengthen and encourage its members. Remember, this was what Paul did. This is his ministry. He used his Roman citizenship, which protected him, gave him due process under the law, and gave him traveling privileges within the Roman Empire. He used it to travel around and to start new churches and strengthen existing ones. And we read in verse 7 that because Paul needs to leave Troas the next day, he spent a week there strengthening the Christians. He's on his last day. He needs to leave. He holds a service that extends late into the night. In fact, he preaches until midnight. Ouch! Boy, that would be uh, difficult. The the service, we're told, is held in a well-lit upper room. And there's a young man there named Eutychus, among others, who's in attendance. And Eutychus is sitting on the ledge of an open window, listening to Paul preach. You know, pretty normal story so far. But this is where it starts to get a little weird, see? Because during Paul's sermon, Eutychus is overcome um, uh, with sleep. And he falls out of the window three floors to the ground and he dies. The Greek word translated as overcome here literally meant to be brought down or cast down. So it's kind of like a play on words. You know, he, he falls asleep, he's brought down, he was literally brought down to the ground, and he dies. What's also ironic is that the name Eutychus in Greek literally means fortunate, <laughs> which I, I thought was interesting as well. But, but uh, so, you know, the moral of the story is that long sermons can have bad effects. Uh, they're dangerous, right? Or, or maybe uh, bad things can happen when you fall asleep during the pastor's sermon, especially if you're in the balcony, right? You know, that's another moral we can take away. Imagine, if only there was a clock on the back wall of this room where Paul was preaching, then maybe people wouldn't have been falling out of windows asleep. But uh, in verse 10, we read that when Eutychus falls out of this window, Paul immediately leaves the worship service. He runs down, and he takes Eutychus in his arms, and he declares, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. So, in the story here, Eutychus, who was dead, has now been brought back to life. So, Paul, in other words, is ministering to him in the spirit and power of Jesus, who also raised people from the dead. But after this amazing miracle, you know, this young man who's, you know, you know, on the ground, and now he's brought back to life. This amazing miracle. What happens next in the story? Do people gather around Eutychus and Paul in amazement and thanksgiving? You know, they start crying out and singing hymns of, of, of thanksgiving? You know, and in verse 11 it says that, that Paul 
nonchalantly, basically, heads back upstairs, and he finishes the worship service like nothing happened. He doesn't miss a beat. He serves communion. There's a time of fellowship afterwards. You know, you have to have coffee hour. And, and then he leaves town. You know, just, just takes off. And this is how this story ends in, in verse 12. It says, Meanwhile, they had taken, they that had taken the boy away alive were not a little comforted. Not a little comforted. How about blown away, you know, uh, without words? It's, it's a peculiar story. But in its oddity, it conveys many powerful truths. And one of them is the dedication of Eutychus's faith. Understanding the cultural context, we can, we can see what this, this story actually, you know, one of the messages it has, because everything about Eutychus in the story bespeaks sacrifice and humility. The kind of hard work, patience, and time we talked about before that's necessary to grow in our relationship with God. How does falling out of a window of sleep convey that? Well, you see, in the ancient world, there, there weren't laws mandating a 40-hour work week. You know, for those who were poor and, and didn't have privilege, there weren't OSHA regulations, you know, uh, that employers had to follow. Your boss didn't need to give you a 15-minute break every few hours. In fact, your boss could work you to death if he wanted to. And since most of the early Christians were poor and subject to these kind of conditions, you know, this young man had probably toiled at work maybe for days without sleep. Yet where was he? At home, in bed, finally getting some rest? No, well, there he was in that upper room, listening to Paul preach the word of God at midnight. Now that's dedication, if you've ever heard it. In other words, another miracle, in addition to Eutychus' resurrection, is that he was even there that day. For it was anything but convenient for him. And why, if he was so exhausted, was he sitting on a window ledge in the first place? I mean, the last place most people would want to sit was teetering on the edge of a three-story building. I mean, that would not be my, my place that I would pick if I was tired. But you see, the early Christians met in very small spaces that were usually packed. So in this room that was, was probably crowded with people gathered to hear of the great apostle Paul, it's likely that Eutychus offered his seat to someone else who needed it more. You know, maybe somebody elderly, perhaps who was sick, someone who couldn't safely sit on a window ledge, maybe a child in the room. Uh, he decided to take an undesirable place to sit in, in the room. It's likely, in other words, that you know, it was a series of, of sacrificial actions on Eutychus's part that led to his fall from that window. Now, these weren't earth-shaking sacrificial actions, you know, but they were profound. Because we can only imagine, after he was raised from the dead, what great places that same dedicated, disciplined, loving spirit eventually took him in his service to Christ. Now, we don't know the rest of Eutychus' story, but I think that's part of the point of this story in the book of Acts. Because we don't know the stories of most of the dedicated Christians who have lived throughout the age, ages. You know, dedicated Christians who have made little sacrifices in the day-to-day -day living of their lives for others you know, that might have caused them difficulties, but which was a living out of, of Christ's mission for them in this world that made big changes with them all working together. Um, there were so many Christians like this who lived throughout the ages. And if we're willing to put in the same amount of hard work, patience, time, and dedication into our faith as they did, then we can experience God's blessings richly as well, just as they did. You know, our, our current culture 
It presents us with an obstacle to faith. It really does. With this value of convenience that's placed above all. It's a big challenge in our day and age. But it's by following the example of the millions of everyday men and women like Eutychus throughout time that will experience the greatest blessings in life. We'll experience the chance to grow spiritually, to genuinely feel God's presence in our lives, the chance to develop a meaningful living relationship with the one who gave us life and who has promised us life eternal, the opportunity to change people's lives for the better all around us in our corner of the world, to witness God's Spirit doing amazing everyday things through us. So this strange story, I believe, um, it challenges us to ask ourselves some really important, profound questions about our faith, which is, am I willing to abandon the idea of convenience when it comes to seeking and serving God? Am I willing to put in the same amount of hard work, patience, time, and dedication that so many of my forebears in Christ have that bore so much fruit for so many people around them in their lives? Am I willing to put Christ and His kingdom first in my life? May God bless us as we answer that question for ourselves. Amen.